Okay. Hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we get going here again? Um, welcome to everybody. Glad you're here and we'll let a few people join in yet as we're coming along, but um, just I'll introduce myself. Um, Chad Steenweik, pastor at Central Avenue Christian Reformed Church here in lovely Holland, Michigan. Sun shining, but cold again. Um, typical West Michigan weather. Um, we're glad you're here. Again, like I said, we've got people from all over uh, North America here. And it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to connect uh, via Zoom this way. Uh, that's one of the blessings of COVID is that we all know how to operate Zoom now. So this is wonderful. Um, today, we have uh, Dave Bielan with us. And um, if you've been around the CRC for any length of time, you probably have heard the name Dave Bielan. Maybe you've worshiped at Madison uh, Square uh, CRC back in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, Dave is now uh, retired, at least officially, from that, uh, that calling and is now uh, working with the Center for Faith and Sexuality and Gender. And so we're going to be hearing from him in just a moment. And Dave Bosher, pastor of Lakeside CRC near Grand Rapids, is going to be moderating that conversation. So we'll see them together. Uh, thankfully, they're able to meet together today for the interview. But before we get there, um, I've asked Laura Copley. Laura Copley is a teacher of high school doctrine down in Rehoboth, New Mexico. So Laura, I'm going to turn the floor over to you or the screen over to you, however we want to say this. If you would just lead us before the Lord in a time of prayer and opening. Absolutely. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, great. I, I'm so honored and blessed to lead in um, devotions this afternoon, particularly because you, Pastor Dave, uh, are here. I uh, sat under your preaching for two years in seminary and I um, we also served for about uh, eight years together um, in Classis Grand Rapids East. And though we never really worked all that closely, I do want you to know that God used you in my life and my husband's life um, through your lifting Jesus high in preaching and through your swimming upstream against cultural currents, but particularly in uh, one really great sermon illustration that my husband and I use all the time. Uh, maybe you know wh which one I'm referring to, but it's about the crap detector. And you had said that sometimes, you know, poop is easy to spot. And, and, and I should know that because I raise chickens and I think I have some right now at the bottom of my boots. But uh, many times crap is not so easy to spot. Uh, it's, it is in the air that we breathe. It's in these lies that we're told by the world that says, you know, what, what is good and what's not good and what a good lo life looks like and who God is and who we are. And so you said that all of us needed a, a, a highly attuned and working crap detector, an invisible crap detector that, um, that, that would kind of go off when we'd come into contact with these lies. And I've, if I remember this correctly, you said that in order for our crap detector to be working, it needed to be dialed in every morning to this word right here. You, you, you said that um, it was as we honed in to the good teaching of scripture, that when we would go out into the world, with our antenna of our invisible crap detector, you know, uh, on alert that when we heard those messages that differed or were opposed to what we read in this book, then beep, 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 you know, the detector would go off and we wouldn't take it in. You advised us to test the spirits, like John says, or to not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed, like Paul said. Or like in Hebrews 5, it says uh, to have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And I think what you did so well, Pastor Bielan, is you showed us in that illustration uh, that it, it wasn't just about the problem of the crappy ideas, but what you really did is show us how beautiful and reliable this word is. And so I want to thank you for leading in devotions this morning because uh, I just took I took it right out of your playbook. But it's been so helpful to see, you know, we have in here all that we need for life and godliness. And so as we enter into a time of prayer, 
I just wanted to read a few verses from that, um, from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, yea, than much fine gold. They are sweeter also than honey, than honey from the comb. And by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there's great reward. Let's pray. Wonderful Lord, we praise you this afternoon that you are exactly who you are. The reason this word is so good is because you are so good. You are perfect. You are trustworthy. You are pure and firm, sweeter than honey, making wise the simple. Your word is as precious as gold, even as the blood that saves us is more precious than gold. We thank you, good Lord, that as the old hymn says, whatever you tell us is right, and you will never deceive us. You'll lead us by the path of life, and never will you leave us. So we trust you, God, that you will lead us this afternoon, that you will lead Pastor Bielan in his reflections and later in our deliberations. We ask that you would use this next 90 minutes to help us indeed test the spirits, to be encouraged in you, and to see glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And now may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's in our good redeemer's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray and all God's people say, amen. Okay. All right, are we handing off the mic to us now? We're getting there. Hold on just a second. Hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll hand off the mic in just a moment, but just a couple of things. Thank you, Laura, for one thing. I, I'm not sure which Dave you were aiming the crap detector at, but we got two. I'm just kidding. Um, thank you for that. No, it was, it was a beautiful, edifying time. Thank you for that. Just so you know, Laura, as well as Jonathan Fisher and Andy Seitzma, they're sort of leading up our prayer team. So today at noon, there's a group that gathered for prayer, and they meet every single Tuesday for prayer. And Laura, if, if you wouldn't mind, would you um, put a, a, a link of a connecting in the chat so that if you'd like to be a part of that prayer meeting, they have an email that they send out every week. We have sent out the links with the emails for these abide project um, mass zooms, but we'd love to have more people join in on that because obviously prayer, how is that not a foundation for uh, what we're doing here as we're moving forward and seeking uh, the Lord to move in faithfulness and, uh, and life. So we're glad for that. So thank you, Laura. Thank we're you, Chad. A... And I'll, I'll put that link up in the chat in just a moment. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Ned, now, so I, I'm going to pass it off to Dave, but a couple of things. If you would like to ask a question, we're going to have a time for Q&A later. Please put those questions in the chat and we will be forwarding those on to Dave so that they kind of have sort of a consolidated uh, question. Uh, so it's a little more organized. So please put those in the chat. We'll get those on. And then um, afterwards, we'll just stay around for a couple of announcements. If you want to hang on after their time together, we'll just uh, fill those things out a little bit more. But now I'm going to pass it off to you, Dave and Dave. Yeah, thank you. I, I almost decided to be a little bit mean and just name it Dave B and Dave B on the Zoom here, <laughs> just to make it really confusing for everybody. Um, yeah, so um, real quick a sec, I think we've already gotten, gotten quite a bit of an introduction to Dave, so I'll forego my own anecdotes. But um, yeah, before we get into the serious stuff, um, I think you'll probably be recognizable to a lot of people who are tuning in, but not everybody. So could you give just at least a little bit of a brief introduction sure. to who you are? Yeah. Um, so Laura, let me start by saying it was delightful to um, hear you uh, reflect on 
a sort of a signature gift that my father gave to me. So I want to I want to say a few words about my dad because he's hugely shaped my life. Um, he's nine. He's ninety two. A meteorologist at the NBC station in Vermont. Somebody can get their camera. We'll get that. Thank you. Okay, my father's ninety two. I meet with him every week for lunch. He'll soon, uh, soon turn 93. And when I was a teenager, anytime I'd go to a movie or, or um, someplace that he wondered, um, how's my son going to do? Is he going to be protected spiritually? He would say, you need to put your crap detector on. So it came from my dad. And someone in my congregation actually made a box, a wooden box with a, a, a buzzer on it that would go like that for, to, uh, for something that you had to kick out of your life. And then there was a light that would shine when the goodness was there. So um, anyway, it was beautiful to uh, hear your reflection. Thank you, Laura. Um, I've been married for 46 years to my bride, Melanie. And we're in a new chapter in our life now because she was a director of Baxter Community Center in Grand Rapids for about 25 years. Our adopted children, we have three adopted children are all in their 30s now. And two of them are married, and I have two grandsons, and I love being a grandfather. In fact, when those little boys sit on my lap, I feel enormous affection for them, and I would lay my life down to protect them. And sometimes our Heavenly Father says to me, that's how much I love you. And um, I'm deeply moved by that because I love these boys so much. And I also fear for them because of the, the life that they're um, entering into, the culture they're entering into which makes me want to do catechism with them, which I do. Um, so try to raise them that way. And one more thing, I love kayaking. Um, in fact, I had hand surgery just uh, last week. Um, um, the doctor said, um, what's coming up that you want to make sure your hand works for? And I said, June kayaking. So he said, all right, let's do surgery now. <laughs> so, um, so Dave, you served at um, Madison Square Church up until recently. And actually, full, full disclosure, uh, he was my pastor briefly while I was a little kid, and he, he uh, taught me how to preach at seminary, so, so I, I feel like I've got my preacher daddy here as well. I think we all have a little <laughs> bit of that going on, some of us. Um, now, how many years were you at Madison Square again? 38. You were there for 38 years. Okay, and then through that, you went through multiple building projects and lots of leadership challenges and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a bit about some of the experience that Dave had in classes, Grand Rapids East. Um, and some of his experience reasoning about homosexuality and, and all the rest. Um, but I'm really excited to hear you talk about this in part because there's a lot of us that can be very bookish and there's a lot of us that can be very personal and pastoral. Um, you're one of the rare people that seems to be gifted with both. You can think deeply and think very personally. As a matter of fact, I almost feel like you're annoyed if you haven't found a way that a, a deep idea can be useful in helping someone's life. And I like that about you. So um, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, both pastorally and dealing with, with gender and sexuality issues. Um, and then I'd also love to hear about what your experience was like in, in classes Grand Rapids East, because I know that you were a bit of, you're a bit of an oddity compared to what some over there seem to be. Yeah. I didn't realize what an oddity I was until that study committee was put together. I, I, I want to go back to when I was a junior in college. Um, I was a resident assistant and um, there were there was another man there. So there was one resident assistant per floor. This was a junior senior dorm, Bolt Hines, I think it was. Anyway, this was at Calvin College. And so there were four floors of girls and two floors of guys. So um, me and the other guy were really close. We're like roommates. We spent a lot of time together. And he was in Greek class with me. So we would do Greek together and got to know each other really well. He was a great storyteller. His eyes twinkled. Um, he had a great laugh. We just loved each other. And one night we were studying Greek together. It was probably after midnight. We're getting ready for a test. And something changed. Um, and he said, I, I want to talk to you about something. I could tell he was nervous. And this was 1974, I believe, maybe 75. And um, he, as they said, came out to me. Um, so the, the, so I think the Christian Reform uh, report was written in 73. I hadn't read it. I didn't even know there was a report. So this is a year or two later. My first introduction to thinking deeply as a Christian about same-sex attraction 
was through the eyes of my friend who I already loved. So um, when Preston Sprinkle's book came out a couple of years ago, the title was People to be Loved. And Preston Sprinkle is two feet planted in the historic Christian view of sexuality. Um, the title of the book attracted me. Um, but let me fast forward and go through some of my history quickly. In 1982, I was ordained as a pastor at, and uh, pastored at Madison. And um, within a few years, we had an elder who uh, identified himself as a celibate homosexual. And then there were two elders after that were, that were in mixed orientation marriages. In other words, the men were attracted to other men sexually, but they had decided the way to follow Jesus is to be married to a woman and they, they both had children as well. So in the late 80s, early 90s, I had um, three different elders who were same sex attracted and would talk to me about um, what that life was like and how to follow Jesus. Um, then I started reading um, a little bit. It was about, I've got some notes here just to go over this. Um, I started preaching sermons on sexuality. So I do a series on sexuality. And already in the early 90s, I had one sermon that was dedicated to how do we deal with homosexuality and people that are same-sex attracted who are among us. And um, it, it felt very, I hesitate to use the word, but it felt progressive. In other words, it was ahead of its time. Um, I didn't find other people that were touching that subject, but it really came out of my conversation I had with my friend in college. Um, then uh, Gra Classes Grand Rapids East formed a committee, and they, they actually, the committee's mandate was to, um, let me read it here a minute, examine and summarize scholarship that supports same-sex marriage. And when the, the mandate itself was um, proposed, I objected to it on the floor of classes because we need to critique it, not just examine it and summarize it. Um, then they formed the committee. There were about eight or nine people on it. And twice they asked me, we have no what they called conservative voices on the committee. We want you to be on it. And um, I looked at the mandate and I said, I really can't serve on this committee considering the mandate. Then they came back a second time, the chair of the committee and the chair of the clerk of Grand Rapids East appealed to me again and said, we'd like you to be on the committee. Um, so then I prayed about it some more, ran it past some people around me, a uh, discernment group. They encouraged me to be on it and um, to give some balance to it and just to see what I could learn. Um, in 2000, uh, 2015, that report was getting ready to get published, and I had to either sign it, um, well, sign it's not quite the right word, you're, you're just, your names are just listed at the end, here's on the committee, and then I insisted that I have a note that I um, am glad that, this, that we're working on this issue, but I disagree with the conclusions of this report, so that was kind of a footnote at the end. And then I decided, instead of trying to write a minority report, which I didn't think people in my congregation would even read, I wrote a 13-page letter to my congregation, um, which I'm happy to talk about at, at some point if Dave or others want to ask about it. In 2016, Preston Sprinkle, I don't know if you know him, but he's a leader in this area in the evangelical world. He got his PhD in New Testament theology. And um, he formed a board, and I was, I'm, I was on that board then, and I still am. Um, and I think he's a great resource for our work. In 2016, I also held a class at Madison to talk about this stuff, because I thought as a pastor, I need to do that. I had, at last count, and that was two years ago, I had read 39 books in the area of same-sex attraction and the Christian approach to it. Um, and I'd be happy, for example, I read Bronson's book and then reviewed it for our elders and, and gave them a copy of it. I helped run a conference at Calvin in 2018, Calvin University. And then just recently, and I'll close with this, I feel like I've been going on too long anyway, but a, a 
a person who um, identified themselves as trans, transgender, started coming to our church, and she was trans, trans, she was transgendering from uh, female to male. Jesus stopped her. That's the way she talks about it. And she was, uh, she stopped the the um, counseling that she was doing and the um, hormone therapy she was doing. And um, she was just baptized this last Sunday at Madison. And Matt and Lori Krieg, who are also members at Madison, um, they're in a mixed orientation marriage. And um, they are strong believers and part of our church. I just say that to encourage all of us. And I want to stop there because that's a long summary. No, I don't, I don't mind that. I think okay. we could all listen for a lot, lot longer. Um, let me, let me start, let me poke at a couple of things. Okay. Um, so first of all, it's really encouraging to hear that over the years, you've had a lot of positive experiences with people who are dealing with their sexual or gender identity, because frankly, a lot of those stories get buried. Uh, perhaps right. part of that is because a lot of those folks who have had good experiences, not all of them have the more, have the fiber to want to be a mascot paraded in front and made a topic of conversation. Um, and then you could also argue that some of it is because frankly, churches don't always handle it very well, tragically enough. So it's, it's good to hear some of those positive stories. I'd be curious to hear more of that um, at some point. But you mentioned a letter that you wrote, and you said that you didn't want to just write a minority report because you're like, I don't think my people would would read this. And that, again, is what I come back to is I, I love that you have a pastoral heart uh, working in parallel with your head. It's not good enough to just know things and have the right answer. I want to lead people. That's great. So when you wrote that letter, um, that 13-page letter, uh, some of us have read that. But... Um, what did you say in that letter? And if you had to put it briefly, and then how was it received? Yeah, so um, first of all, strategy wise, <clears throat> I decided not to try to make this a, a, a statement from our church. I also, also didn't want the elders to um, be surprised by it or to know how to, I don't know, what's the word, defend, talk about it when people ask them. So I first submitted it to them, and I said, I am not asking you to agree with every line in this letter, because I think it'll take too long for us to get there. This is not a committee project. This is me as a pastor speaking to our congregation based on the kind of things I'm hearing. So what I don't want you to do is treat it like a report or a, or a, or a statement of the church, but that you are encouraging me as a pastor to write this letter to the congregation as a pastoral letter from their pastor, with the, which the elders have reviewed. So strategically, I tried to put it in a place where it wouldn't get bogged down, because frankly, there were elders who were affirming on that elder group, um, which I also didn't know until I wrote the letter. Um, I would say the, the letter in some ways um, surprised people. We're known as a church of inclusion. I don't usually use that word these days because it carries freight that I don't, I don't like. Um, and we've got our own words in the, in the scriptures. So I just talk about the beloved community or the church. Um, but we're known as a church of inclusion, and especially along the issue of race. And we were early adopters of women in uh, positions of leadership in our, in our church. So I think it was surprising for some folks. In fact, a section of my letter was, how is this different than the women in office um, approach? Or people would say, hey, we were, from our church would say, we were wrong about whether women could serve, people from Madison would say this, are we wrong about this as well? Are we just going to change our mind? So I had to address that issue. Um, but I actually started with a prayer of confession, because a, a shorthand way of doing this is, is to say, our posture has been like this, or like this, we need our posture to be like this, to same sex attracted people. And our position needs to remain because it's biblical. So let's shift our posture and solidify our position. Um, just giving word, people words in a shorthand way to address this. So I tried to do that in the paper and then start with our church, the, the church, not Madison in particular, but the Church of Jesus Christ has um, treated people who are 
um, attracted to the same sex in ways that have um, hurt them deeply. And we just need to start with there. Let's get the speck of the log out of our own eye first. So then after that prayer of confession, um, I talked about the big picture of marriage and the purpose of sex. What is it? And then does Jesus speak to same sex marriage? And is this like women in office? And then advice to the church and then advice to same sex attracted people. And then I closed with a, a letter to um, uh, a made up person, so to speak. I named her Alicia. So started with confession and ended with a pastoral letter to someone who was sort of a composite uh, person of uh, people that I had pastored over the years. So how, well, how was that received when you publicized that letter? You said already that you were surprised that a couple of your elders were not where you thought that they were. Yeah. Um, were there any other surprises in terms of how that was received? Um, I think... It, it got widely distributed. I didn't realize I started getting emails from people that I didn't know or um, I hadn't seen in 10 years or 20 years saying, can I have a copy of your letter? Um, and uh, part of what we did is we didn't make it a, on purpose available on our website. People had to come to me to get it. Um, so I was a little surprised about how fast it moved into um, other churches and other connections that we had. Um, there were a lot of people at Madison who said, thank you for doing this. Um, I think there was a there was a lot of people who said that. However, there was a pretty strong vocal minority that pushed back. So I knew this was going to be difficult. Um, I didn't realize I was going to lose so many friendships over this. That surprised me. Wow. So, so um, how over what pro, over what period of time did all of that hit? I mean, was that was that like one really bad week, or one really bad uh, month, or one really bad year? No. It, it it actually the the initial response is the people that um, were saying thank you, Pastor, for putting this letter together. I agree with you. Right away, they started talking to me about it. And um, some of them would engage in conversations. Um, some of the parents who had same-sex attracted kids used it as an as a opportunity to say, oh, we think we can talk to our pastor. This, the tone of this letter and the way I talked about it in the congregation to them said, hey, we can go talk to Pastor Dave about this. Some same-sex attracted people that I didn't know were in the congregation, um, they came and talked to me. Some of them disagreed. It was after about six months or to a year, especially when Matt, it became clear and clear that Madison Church was not going to change its position, but would align with the denominational's stated position on the website. Um, some people tried to change us. When that didn't work, um, they left. And at, that's actually some of them just left. See, that would be... 2016, 2022, that's six years. Mm -hmm. So some people hang tough for quite a while. Um, but I would say we, we lost people over this and I think it hasn't, it's, it hasn't finished. There's still more, there's still more sorting out going on. Yeah. So let me, let me pick up on that. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, at Abide, we are, we're convinced that um, the CRC really needs to take a solid position on this. This is not an issue that we can have it both ways on and stay together. And nor has it been for any other denomination. You were telling, you mentioned that to me earlier when we were talking right. before this. Um, and so a lot of what we're appealing to, um, there are pastors that are worried about dividing their denomination and who will pay a great personal cost. You know, some of our churches are, are more united on this than others. I will speak personally and say that we're our denomination to come down on a hard orthodox position um, I don't think there'd be very many people in my congregation to fight me. A lot of people who fight that have already left, and a lot of the people who have been won over who were on the opposite side by God's mm -hmm. grace. But there's other people where they may, you know, if, when this hits one way or the other, there are pastors who are already tired from COVID who are going to find themselves in a position where they have these emotional appeals from people saying, I, my friend or my son or my so-and-so is, how could you say this? Um, or how could you divide us over this? And so a lot of the pain that you felt, I feel like, we're going to face down some of us will 
And so here's my question for you. Um, what advice would you give pastorally? I mean, you, you had to write this letter and have this conversation in a healthy way in your church, and it still was painful. What advice would you give to pastors who are trying to figure out um, how they're going to navigate that come what may after June uh, yeah. in Synod? Um, part of the reason I wrote the letter in 2015 is I could see what's coming now. Um, I, of course, I didn't know the details or the timing of it, but I felt like if I didn't do this now um, and get the tone right, not just the content right, but the tone right, and for example, it would open the door for me a month or two or three or six months later to actually pray a prayer that would include people who are same sex attracted in our congregation. Because I, I, I wouldn't have to pray that prayer and then have people wonder, well, where's he at on this? Is he starting to slip and slide? Because they already have the letter and it's well known in the congregation. So it was, it's, it was actually um, a little late. I mean, I, I thank God for my friend at Calvin who came out that night um, because I don't think I would have been preaching about same-sex attraction already in the 90s um, if I hadn't had that, that gift. Yeah. I didn't ask for that. God just gave it to me, and I would see it through his eyes. Um, now, he, he actually tried to do a mixed orientation marriage and had two children. Um, he was at my wedding. I wasn't at his wedding because I was on an internship, but we, we remained friends, but eventually his marriage came apart. So, so I don't want to make it sound like the people that I've known have all been able to manage this costly discipleship pathway that they've chosen easily. It's not been easy at all. Just a little more uh, to try to be specific with your question, Dave. Um, The reason I'm on Preston Sprinkle's board is because he does the very things that you're asking about. If you go to that website, the Center for Gender, Faith, and Sexuality, he's got pastoral papers in there, and he's very pastoral himself. Um, and uh, I would say read things that help you get prepared for the very kind of emotional questions that people have and listen to them well, listen to them before you start. I mean, it's it's basic pastoral wisdom is make sure you listen to people and don't speak out of your fear, but out of your love for the people that God has called you to, um, to, to shepherd. And I would also say, I wrote a note to myself um, to make sure I said this today. Um, I had to be more concerned what Jesus thinks of me than what people think of me. I mean, that's not just true about this conversation. It's about everything. So I imagine myself in front of Jesus and him saying to me, you made it. I forgave your sins. Welcome home. Um, you said some things you shouldn't have said, or you had a chance to say some things and you didn't. I mean, it's not as if I'm going to go to purgatory because I don't think it's there, but... <laughs> Um, I really, I really want to have in front of my imagination all the time, whereas maybe part of my crap detector is how does my Lord feel about what I'm saying as a pastor? I need to be more concerned. On, uh, the fear of the Lord needs to be stronger than the fear of people. And then um, read um, Sprinkle's stuff, Preston Sprinkle, the, the Center for... Um, gender, faith, and sexuality um, has some has some new videos out. I mean, they've been doing stuff for young people. So um, I would order that. It's a, it's a $200 investment, but there's 12 sessions there. They're very well put together. It's high quality stuff from Jackie Hill Perry. If you might know mm -hmm. her name, for example, is one of the presenters. And it's really geared for young people. Um, another thing I would say is, you might, you probably won't be able to win those people who are already soft affirming and they become hard affirming um, in the in the just the cultural flow of today's world. But you have a responsibility, in my view, as elders, pastors, leaders in the church, 
to catechize the youth because they are getting catechized by the culture around them and they need a strong, firm, winsome, compassionate, pastoral um, catechism on uh, many things, but particularly human sexuality. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good answer. I appreciate that. And I think um, it can be really scary to listen to the other side because frankly, sometimes we're afraid there are questions that might arise that would surprise us. And oftentimes we're afraid of what we might be called. But I, I just think that's so key what you mentioned that um, we actually have to figure out how to represent Jesus well in doing that. I like that you started from, uh, you know, the, that you're grateful that the start as a pastoral issue for you and not just an academic one on paper. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, and um, so let me let me kick another question your way. And by the way, um, some of you are putting questions in the chat. And I'm going to get to those in just a minute. If you have any of those, start start kicking those up, and then chat will chat will start sending them my way. But I have a couple other things to ask you about first. So, pulling out. So you uh, on the ground, you know, you're concerned about our our overall witness in the gospel, and you're also concerned about on a discipleship level, how are we leading people on sexuality? And it seems like you are really, really passionately convinced that the local congregation and the pastor. Yeah, it's very important for us to stick to what God says, because he loves other people more than we do. And I'm going to go ahead and assume that if he says one thing and I think another, probably he's the one that's more loving than me, not the other way around. Um, but now pulling out from that, though, we're now in a situation where we have a denomination where we have a lot of pooled resources. We have a leadership pipeline, uh, namely college and seminary. Uh, we have pooled ministries. And we have sort of these mutually supporting groups called classes that work together. And right now, the question that's on the radar for a lot of people, there are people who would disagree with us on sexuality, but I think even more so there's people in the denomination who would go, yes, but why, why is this the thing to divide over? Why this? So um, my question for you is, how would you respond to people who are saying, why would we as a denomination divide over this? And maybe secondarily go into the question of there are some people that go, hey, we can agree to disagree on women in office. And I know there's probably some people in here who think that, that that's something we shouldn't agree to disagree about. But um, for the folks that, that say, why can't we do the same thing with this? Um, how do you respond to that particular group mm -hmm. of people? And sometimes I re sometimes that's coming at you sincerely. Sometimes that's a mask for fear. And they just want to say that because they're afraid of what they'll lose if they right. open up the conversation. Yeah. But either way, um, how do you talk to that person? What do you say? Yeah. Well, I'll talk to myself about it. The, 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 the person themselves, you just have to read the situation. Um, and with quite a few people, I've, I've said to them, what have you read or what have you watched? And often with younger people, it's what they've watched um, that raises questions for you. Um, and then whatever it is, I watch it and read it and I say, Let's trade resources. And this is for if it's just a watcher. In other words, they're not readers and they're not academically tuned up. I will, I will watch their thing and they'll watch my thing. So I, it, it's costly. It means I have to set aside time. I've got to watch it and I've got to figure out what kind of questions will arise when, when they talk to me. Um, the the person who's saying these things or asking me, for example, why divide on this? Um, I actually think it's a symptom or a sign of something deeper that's going on. And that is, what is the Bible? What is its authority? What, what are our hermeneutical principles? And um, that's my main concern. And actually, if I, if I, if I address people that are older than me, and I'm 67, generally, I'm saying to them, your posture needs to change, your tone needs to change. These are people whom God loves. These are brothers and sisters in Christ, to people who are same sex attracted. To the younger generation, the, I think there's a much larger project. And that is how do I preach? How do I teach? How do I catechize? How do I help parents deal with this? so that um, the authority of scripture and the place of the Bible in their life is enhanced. And that's, that's something that's on us. That's on us as leaders. We need to figure out a way to, how do we disciple our people better? Because they're getting discipled. 
and it's or catechized and it's through mass media these days or or social media okay all right fair, fair enough um so one one thing i maybe maybe i didn't miss it but so why why would you uh so we we're not dividing over women in office but we do want to divide over homosexuality oh. if you had to take a direct shot at that what would you say well women in office there are actually strains um in scripture that if you say women shouldn't be preaching and teaching and leading in these ways there are passages you have to deal with that are difficult for your position if you take the other side and say women can lead and teach and do these various things there are passages that are difficult for you to line up with that in other words there's um <clears throat> there's a there's a there are there are um hermeneutical concerns and conversation you've got to have about that and there there are there are um old testament judges deborah there are women prophesying the new testament there are passages that say um in galatians uh, 3 28 they talk about neither jew nor greek male and female but there's no heterosexual homosexual there's every single place in the scripture where homosexuality is raised it's uniformly and strongly put in the category this is not the will of god and it's against the will of god and it runs to it runs into one of the core metaphors or image that's used in scripture which is the bride and the bride, bridegroom that's from genesis chapter 3 or 2 actually all the way to the revelation 22 where the bride and the bridegroom meet again it's it's the it's a main metaphor and you don't mess with one of god's main metaphors okay so in other words if i'm hearing you right you know you look at at the women in office issue and, and go like look i can look at this and see that there's actual scriptural difficulties you know there's a part where i'm sure somebody could disagree with me on this and not be actively misunderstanding or twisting this it could just be a simple they've misunderstood or i've misunderstood but when it comes to homosexuality you're saying not only is this incredibly clear and there's nothing in the bible that runs the other way but it, in fact it's actually hitting a target that's even more important that's the image of marriage itself um, and so you, you would say one of these is exceed, exceedingly clear, far more than the other, and therefore you'd have to be turning away from the Bible as a teacher not to get it. Yes, but the only way you can make that statement in today's environment is if you have read the, um, the revisionist work, because, for example, if they make a claim, but Paul didn't know about or he didn't address what I experience, which is non-exploitative, consensual covenanted sexual relationships hmm. so you, you've got to so it isn't as if there's no hermeneutical issues here um you've got that's why i read all those books i read um um people would bring me books and you know how pa pastors get that all the time oh, listen yeah. to this this you know podcast you got to listen to this here's a book you've got to read when it came to this issue because i knew it was the defining issue for us in in today's environment I would read their books, I would read it carefully, I would underline stuff, and I would meet them again and say, let's talk about this. Um, but I had to do my homework, I had to be able to say, for example, quote, and have, um, you know, have my, my, my homework done, and say, it's actually not true that in the ancient world, there weren't covenanted or consensual relationships, yeah. same sex. In fact, most people aren't making that claim anymore because they get undercut by by the um, um, the historians and the archaeologists and the well. The not to scholars. mention, isn't there even a, a reference to that in Plato's Republic, which is like right. the most well attested to ancient text besides the Bible? Right. So you've right. got to you've yeah. got to. I'm glad you know that because you've got to be able to say that to people because they're many of them are doing their own research. They are going online. They're listening to this stuff. So you've got to know what they're what they're what they're listening to it and be able to pretty quickly um, engage them and say, well, have you considered this? So, well, let, let me hit you with a few questions from the chat okay. because there's been there's been a, been a few people talking. Um, so here, uh, first question, um, Dave, from your per no, it doesn't say which Dave. I'm just going to assume you. That's my guess, Dave. From your perspective, um, why is it that people want to change the church's stance? In other words. Um, what do you think are the motivations behind the people who are 
very much wondering what in the heck we're doing. Yeah. Um, who are very much pushing the denomination to be um, what they what they would call open and affirming. Right. Well, that's a matter of putting myself in their shoes. And um, if they have heard, and many of them have heard over and over and over again, God is love, and he is. Um, and uh, the push to be accepting, and if they haven't heard much about what the gospel is, and how judgment is actually an expression of the love of God, and they haven't been able to figure out that it, what that is, and how justice and mercy meet at the cross, um, the, I can see where they um, come to the position they are, especially because of the way culture forms our church members over the last several decades. So, um, in fact, some of them will say to me, this is a matter of justice. Um, you're heterosexual. Um, you get to express your sexuality. Um, you're in, in control and power. You can sort of hear the argument. And um, Jesus was for the powerless. I mean, I, I, I need to make their argument as well as it better than they make it to be able to actually listen to them well and then um, try to help them consider that uh, the most loving thing you can do for somebody is understand what God's design for human sexuality is and then encourage them to be obedient. And it really helps in our church that we have some same-sex attracted people who are passionately in love with Jesus, very winsome, and can talk about what it means to follow in this costly obedience. So um, piggybacking off of that then, um, what do you see? I've got another question from the chat. So I, I assume you've read the Human Sexuality Report, or at least uh, portions of it. No, I read the whole thing. Okay, the day good. it came out. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, I never, I never want to put someone on the spot right. and then have, have them be right. like, "Well, actually," <laughs> um, because it it is long, and I know certain people yeah. do skip certain parts. But yeah. uh, so you read through that, and I'd I'd be curious to hear you comment on uh, what do you think the strengths and weaknesses are of that particular report. Uh, one of the strengths is that in my view, is that it doesn't just deal with same-sex attraction or homosexuality. It deals with our broken sex sexuality. It also tells stories. Um, and I think, it, I think it addresses many, many, maybe not all, but many of the revisionist options that are put out there. And I thought did it really quite well. Even the pastoral part to me, I know a lot of people say it's not pastoral, but then I want to ask them, well, do you agree with it, with the exegetical work, with the, um, you know, the way the scripture is explained? And often they don't, well, then I can see where they think the pastoral part isn't very pastoral. But it really wasn't meant to be mostly a pastoral report. It was mainly to be, um, what does scripture say about this? Let's update what we said in 1973. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Is, is, do, you, do you see any weaknesses to it? Or are you mostly just like, you know, I think it turned out pretty well. Are there weaknesses to it? I guess if I go and read it again, I could pick some things apart. But I thought it was, as soon as it came out, I knew some of the authors of it. And a woman from our church was actually on the committee. I wrote them right away and thanked them for it. And I thought, this is, yeah. this is really well done. I think yeah. it's a good piece of work. I, I, I tend to, I tend to agree. Um, Okay, so a couple, a couple of other questions people have from the chat, and I'm going to go through some of these a little bit quicker because I, I do want to get through more of them. Uh, <coughs> pardon. Um, so regarding your church, from your perspective, uh, or hold on, that's a different one. So how has Madison Square been connecting in the broader Grand Rapids East classes? Have they been able to or inclined to appeal um, the decision about Neyland? The decision about Neilan came after I was um, off the scene as one of the leaders of the uh, congregation. And Madison was actually uh, engaged with um, a group of about 30 people that were still trying to make our church be an affirming church. So they had no energy. Some of them would say, that I would be the one who would write that. And if I were there, I would have been the one to write it. And the other pastors that were left didn't have the capacity. And I don't mean they didn't have the smarts. They just didn't have the, 
the time and energy to do that. Um, so Madison has been, um, it was mostly uh, myself who was engaged in this and the other pastors, in some ways I was sort of cover for them. <laughs> they did their preaching and teaching and now they're on the front lines and they've got to respond to this, but they're trying to deal with the division within our own congregation rather than um, what classes is up to. Because I think classes seems to, feels to the pastors at Madison um, that it's not worth the effort. Okay. Um, we, we're not, we're not, um, we're in such a minority in our own classes that it, it probably, we probably couldn't get enough momentum going. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the other questions is how, how pastors are going in Grand Rapids East. But what I'm hearing from you is it, like the conservative pastors in Grand Rapids East, it sounds like some of the more orthodox biblical pastors and churches, it, would, it, would it be fair to say that they are just not spending a lot of time and energy on Grand Rapids East right now? You mean the pastors who you described as orthodox that are in classes, Grand Rapids yes. East? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, because they're a minority there. You were too. You know, I don't. I don't know. My, I would say that most pastors have to dial up a lot of courage to do this. They know it's gonna. They're gonna spend energy on it. They would rather not divide the church over it. Um, I thought the church was gonna divide anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it will come and find you no matter where you are. This issue is what I mean by it. it'll come and find you. And I thought I should get ahead of it, but I'm also built. My personality is built different than many other pastors are in terms of when people described my ministry, it's generous of you to say that I was compassion and pastoral. And I've learned that, but I'm a truth guy. And and the crap detectors, actually, I mean, the, Laura picked out something that's kind of a main um, memory for very many, many people that have been in My that mother church. still uses that phrase to this day because of you. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to say that, but now that it's back up again, Laura, thanks for that. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it, it felt like a calling on my life and that I was, I was arranged by God to do this. And I, I want to say to other pastors, let me be a little sharper here at this point. I think pastors are what one of my seminary professors called resident theologians in their church, which is why I read all those books. And I don't think you can abdicate on this. I think you have to define where you are, and you've got to do it generously and compassionately and lovingly, but you've got to do it clearly. Um, I just, and, and I would think of it this way, God is going to hold me accountable for whether or not I'm going to um, have the courage to say what needs to be said when the when the time came, and for me that was 2015. Okay, cool. Well, let me. Uh, so there's a couple of questions here. I think I can actually kind of combine um, into one. So I think um, one of the things that's obviously in a lot of people's minds is that uh, there's going to be a big earthquake coming for us um, in in June, one way or another. I mean, if the if the reports passed and it's adopted, and maybe even some enforcement comes, that does one thing. If it's not adopted, or if, it, or if the can gets kicked down the road somehow, there's fallout from that too. Um, so I suppose I have, I have two questions. You can take them in whatever order you like. Um, one is, if this report is rejected, if it's not adopted, what do you think that looks like for both, you know, you can, you can take the big picture perspective of the denomination or what it's going to do to local churches. What do you think that does to us as a denomination? And my second question is, if you had to paint the most optimistic possible picture of our future, so it gets adopted, we do the right thing. Um, if you had to paint an optimistic picture of what things could look like, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years out, what would that look like? So you hear what I'm saying? Like, take us down both of those tracks in your yeah. imagination. You can take either one first. I don't care. Well, I would say I'll, I'll answer the first one about if it gets rejected, I think that um, there probably are a lot of churches that will say it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I think whatever decision is made, 
there's going to be a number of churches that will say it's time to leave. And um, I think um, the RCA is ex ex experienced when I talk to pastors from the Reformed Church of America, the kick the can down the road because we want to maintain unity actually for them hurt their unity. Or to put it another way, when they met someone in, in Myers, a local grocery store, who was on the other side of them, um, because there was so much um, anger and frustration and um, energy put into this thing, it made it harder and harder for them to just greet them well afterwards. So I, I actually, so, so to answer the second part of it, I wish we would decide quickly um, what we're gonna, what we're gonna, are we gonna accept this report or not? What are we gonna do with, with discipline? Because I think if you, if you just accept the report and there's no discipline to people who don't follow it or no consequences, then, um, then we're still going to have problems. So I would rather have us had a clean cut and then say, if you're affirming, here's a group of churches you can go with. If you're not affirming, this is the way things are going to go. And we do a parting that is um, as, as smooth as possible and as quick as possible. And we don't try to maintain a false unity. I think it only hurts people. So that that's based on some of my conversations I've had with RCA pastors. Okay. Now uh, let's, let's suppose for a minute we do, let's say that happens. Let's say that, um, let's say that you could wave a magic wand and exactly what you said just happens. Um, in what ways do you think the church could get healthier or do better in the future as a result? And I ask that because, um, you know, one of the things that has surprised me is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who can talk about how things could go wrong. Um, but if I, if I had a group of pastors say, like, if I say one minute about things going right, everybody's head goes up because we don't spend that much time talking about that. And I think we're all hungry to be able to look forward to something instead of dreading something. Yeah. So, um, in what ways, if you had to use your imagination in what ways do you think the CRC could get healthier as a result of finishing this fight, putting it behind us? Yeah. I don't know about denominationally. I would say though, for a local church, if you can get on the same page, and the people who disagree can can leave with it with the, the least consternation as possible. And I don't know how that happens, but um, that you can quit spending so much energy in fighting that or trying to hold the denomination together and way more energy where I think it belongs, which is how are you going to disciple your own people, yeah. particularly your young people, um, because they are being, as I said before, they're being discipled, which is why... Um, Preston Sprinkles thing to me is so important, and there's probably other examples of it, but this is the only one I know, where they use um, the medium that the young people um, are going to watch, like um, videos that they're going to watch, that there are high quality videos, and they're done really well by other young people in their 20s and early 30s. So that's that's actually where I think we need to spend our energy. So that, that's actually the scenario I want to paint. And it isn't just about human sexuality. It's about the, the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ and that eternity is in the balance every time, every Sunday morning, the, the beauty and necessity of Jesus. That's, I want us to get to that and be energized by um, the call of God to make disciples. And I think those kinds of churches and the ones who are who survey the sexual wreckage out there because it's all over the place i think churches that teach human sexuality and the beauty of it and then model it are going to start attracting people that have tried and i'm not just talking about same sex but about the sexual wreckage out there in general yeah. that they need a place to come to where they're going to be cared for and loved and and sexual holiness is going to be is going to be painted beautifully like it is in scripture. So in other words, what you say is like, you're like, I'm looking forward to, you're saying this, you're like, I'm looking forward to the freed up energy. Yep. Like the amount of time that we spend fighting over this, instead we can work on pastorally loving people on these very same issues, which is really interesting because that goes to what you just said that the guys in the RCA will say, you actually hurt the cause by staying divided. Because if you care about people who struggle with their gender or their sexuality, then the fact that I spend my time arguing with you about basic principles is actually keeping me 
yeah. I'm spending my time figuring out and how to walk alongside and navigate with the people who are in the most pain. Yeah. And that's not a way a lot of people think of it. A lot of people think of it as, as like by sort of keeping this false peace that somehow that serves, it serves the unity of the church, but it also we're being sensitive to those folks. When in fact, it's keeping us from the tasks of learning to love and disciple those folks. And I, that's a great insight. Um, I'm looking, I, I'm freed looking, up energy could do a lot of things. Yep. I'm looking forward to more baptize, baptisms like we had last Sunday. And Kat, her name is Kat. Um, she's got leadership ability. She's been on Preston Sprinkle's um, leadership forums as a speaker. Um, if I were hiring somebody right now, I'd hire her because she's completely committed to the historic Christian view of sexuality. She knows from the inside the other way, and she will, she will appeal to young people. They're in our churches, and they need pastors and elders and church leaders who are going to do this well and do it with um, gospel confidence. In other words, humble confidence. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Let me go to go to a couple more questions uh, from the chat. I know one of the ones that I saw. Um, so you've you've been you've been in the game for years. Some of us here are, are younger and haven't navigated the political waters as often. And some of them are older. Look at them. Oh yeah, yeah, ancient. <laughs> and so you can get away with saying that because you're 67. If I say that, they'll come they'll come right through the camera and kill me. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, but some of us some of us though haven't been through that many battles on the synodical level. Like I would say, before all of this fight, I kept my nose to the grindstone. Yeah. I thought of denominational politics as a distraction. So, um, if you had to predict, knowing what you know and having been around as long as you've been around, um, let's say that, that the report passes, but it doesn't really pass with any other notable enforcement. We just say this is this is the confessional boundary. Here it is. What do you think happens next? Do you think that that's enough that churches that are more liberal on this start to self-eliminate and reaffiliate elsewhere? Um, do you think they stay and fight at Synod, or do you think something else happens? What are what do you imagine? Where do you think that would be? Yeah, like what's the outcome of just passing that and not getting anything else done? Um, well, you preface this by saying I've been around for a while, but my I didn't do much denominational battling. I went to Synod twice. Um, I, 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 I actually thought I have a call. It's to pastor this church. Um, I better do this well. And um, this is a handful already to begin with. So that was my orientation. Now, I don't think people who call this justice issue and want our denomination to become affirming will give up because the report was passed. I also think, though, that this is not just true about the Christian Reformed Church. It seems to be true about institutions in our culture that formal institutional ways of getting things done doesn't seem to be working very well, and informal networks of like-minded people is where the energy is. Yeah. So actually, Abide is an example of that. Okay. So that, that makes good, good sense. Um, so what, I, what I'm hearing is, unless, unless there's some enforcement put out there, we should really ready ourselves for a protracted conversation afterwards. I think even if there is enforcement, um, <laughs> we're, st we're still going to be caught up in um, tests of that enforcement and reversals of that enforcement. And yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think I have any good handle on that future at all. So I hesitate to just knowing human nature and watching um, church fights, I, I think people will dig in. So I, that's why I think the sooner we can figure out how to separate peaceably as possible, the better off we are. Okay, um, fair enough. That, that's good. Um, let's see here. Other good questions. So um, it says, Dave, thank you for your insight um, about, quote, shifting our, our posture and solidifying our position. Uh, supposing the sexuality teaching gets voted on as having confessional status, what sort of church discipline issues should pastors begin to get ready for? And what sort of posture should we take towards church discipline? <laughs> we keep it light here. I guess so. You know, I think, um, I think a great deal of pastoral uh, care happens in worship leading and preaching and and of course on one-on-one -on -one. so you're you're laying the groundwork for that and i think i think 80 percent of discipline ought to happen 
in um, one-on-one -on -one or small group relationships that doesn't ever rise any higher than that. Because if you're doing that well, then the, then the other stuff um, is grounded in relationships and conversations that have already happened. So most of the horror stories about um, church discipline have to do with a decision that was made or, or a, 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 a divorce filing. And then all of a sudden the elders are involved. And yeah. so I, I would say, um, you know, training your people, your people, meaning the elders and, and other decision makers on how, how, what's a biblical approach to good, good discipline. But I think you're going to have to, I think we have to, we've got to have church discipline actually for the sake of young people, because they tell stories about hypocrisy all the time. And the way you deal with um, hypocrisy is you say, here's what our standards are, and then you actually enforce them. So, yeah. Um, so this isn't from the chat. This is just from me. Okay. I'm, go I'm going back to my own questions. I'm take taking the mic again. Um, I think that hearing what you said in some of this is we all deep down know this. We don't like to hear it. It's a little sobering to go man, um, like we want to think we're going to have our Martin Luther here I stand moment in June. And then it's just all going to be done and it's all going to be decided. And hopefully we're much closer to that. I mean, I think it's a very important step. Without it, we'd be in big trouble. Um, but a lot of us go like, oh man, that sounds tiring. Meanwhile, we hear about being on the opposite end of this where so many other things are possible and energy is freed up. And I know I've heard a, heard a lot of pastors go, why doesn't my church just leave the denomination right now? And as a matter of fact, I know there's certain churches saying, saying we're, our patience is wearing very thin. Uh, we don't want to stick around for this. So if you had to talk to somebody like that, um, what reasons would you give for why a church ought to bear with the CRC a bit longer? I mean, I'm sure you have a point where you think that it would be wise to disaffiliate. We all have different lines. Um, but what would you say to somebody who's wondering if it's time yet to go? Yeah. Well, um, what hill to die on? There was actually, a, I think, a book recently that was written that I think makes good distinctions between these issues. But the way I would generally put it is sometimes our elders would make decisions and they were strategy decisions. And I made speeches in the elders against the strategy that looked like was gonna win the day. And I, I, um, I was passionate about it and then I lost. And then I had to defend it in front of the congregation because I was one of the main purveyors of here's what's going on. And um, I had to even in my body language support what the elders had done. And I'm not saying strategy is un unconnected with creedal issues and, and, and salvation issues, but I would say, I think I would, so to speak, hear the Holy Spirit say to me, do not divide over strategy, only divide on things that um, go you know, deep down, and then you've got, then you got to have wisdom about that. And you have to have someone who asks you really important questions about it. But I would say, you know, the make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, Ephesians chapter four, there's so many passages like that, that I want to hear the Holy Spirit through Paul challenge me about that. And I can't just say I'm tired. Try that one out on Jesus. <laughs> Oh, you're tired. Tell me about that. What's it like to be tired? So um, I would say, you, you know, you, you almost want to predefine with your leadership, what is the line that, that if it gets crossed? Like, for example, in my own congregation, if they were to publicly support same-sex marriage or ordain someone who's involved in a same-sex relationship or perform a marriage of a same-sex couple, that would be an action that I wouldn't I would say it's time to leave yeah. in my own congregation, which could happen, I guess, in the future sometime. But I've already thought that through and figured out why that's the line. Yeah, and I, th I think that's a, that's a really wise piece of advice to start having a conversation with your elders about, okay, where, where is our line? That's a conversation we're afraid to have, but the trouble with is that you're going to have it no matter what. And the question is, are you doing it with a cool head? Um, or are you doing it when the bullets are already flying and when there's there's high stakes and the congregational pressure's on? Well, um, and the and the what brings heat to it is you you start to you make the decision here, then it's the cooler head thing. It's about principles, and it's not tied to a person necessarily. 
you see what I'm saying? You can yeah. make the decision down there when the daughter of one of our elders wants to get married to another woman, what are we going to do? If you've already made the decision, you've talked this through, you apply the principle and it's not about that person and yeah. that relationship. So you're, I mean, it ends up being about them, of course, because they're asking, but you, you've thought about this in advance and you've thought it through and you've made it public. You've made it known. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So I, I've got, I've got only two more questions for you. Okay. Um, uh, here, here's the first one. Um, here's one. I, so uh, wondering if Dave could share some thoughts on strategy leading up to June, are there practical things that we need to be doing or paying attention to as Senate approaches in our churches or at classes? <laughs> read acts 15 <laughs> you know they uh, that the first synod right and there was great consternation and great disagreement and then prayer i you know one of my um one other thing my dad used to talk to me about is that you need to grow a thick skin and maintain a soft heart so a thick skin meant I wasn't defensive. I'm not a thin skin person as someone who's easily offended. Um, and I, even when other people are easily offended, how can I not be easily offended? So to me, that only happens in prayer. This, this may sound simplistic, but I don't see, I mean, um, uh, Chad, was t Chad Steen Steenweich was talking about prayer every Tuesday at noon. And then Laura said, you know, here's a way to get involved in that. Um, that seems enormously important to me. I mean, whoever is going to go to synod, if their own soul is soaked in prayer, they're far more likely to be courageous when they need to be courageous and wise at the same time. I mean, I get wisdom and then I have no courage to do it or I got all kinds of courage and I don't know what to say. So, you know, praying for courage and wisdom and asking God for it as a gift, um, and then praying together, uh, the greatest strategy, in my view, is to be um, praying for and caring for one another. And if you're praying for your enemies in the church, you're far more likely to be Christ-like. And that doesn't mean soft. It means soft-hearted, but thick-skinned, or having courage and wisdom which is what jesus was like he sure for was. sure i mean yeah. like every time somebody thinks that they can trap him in something they wind up in their very own trap he was tough but he could turn around and be right in somebody's mud puddle yeah. and be kind and soft and he didn't turn around and fight he was he, he was he met with nicodemus late at night who was part of the group of people hunting him yeah. and he could instantly become tender um I think that's great advice because you just said well focus on being like jesus first and then maybe work on the other stuff which yeah. is it's pretty basic, but it's easy to forget. If if you're a reader and you want a really great book to understand the culture, read Carl Truman's book. Oh, what's the title? You know the title? No. You don't, you don't even know the book I'm referring to? No, I don't. Somebody I I will know Rise it. Rise and Triumph of the um, Modern oh, Self? Yeah. So and one of the things that did for me is it is it it got me to thinking that me and my people have been formed for several hundred years already by another catechism, um, another way of getting your identity. And it gave me great compassion for the, for the flock that I'm leading. And it also um, made me um, understand how huge the task is and that this will take generations um, to um, reestablish what it means to be a person, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be in the image of Christ, what it means to be in the image of God and then remade in the image of Christ. So that, and in fact, if I was in charge of a seminary, I'd make all the seminarians read it and discuss it and understand it and apply it. <laughs> so there's something you could do, but it's not a small book. It's 400 pages or so. Hmm. Well, la last question. Last question. And by the way, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm actually getting texts from people directly who are watching saying, thank you. This is great. So that's oh, wonderful. Well, good. Um, <laughs> glad to know it's good for everybody else and not just me. Um, 
here's here's my last question is there anything else that you think god has put on your heart to share with us or anything else that just happens to be on your heart that you'd like to say before we get going yeah i have i got raised um on hymns and um i have pulled out the church's one foundation and sung it or put it on my uh, um on my phone and listened to it over and over and over again because our ancestors in the faith have gone through um, schisms rent asunder. That's one of the lines of the, of the hymn. So if you go back that far, or you love hymns. That's another thing I would say to you is listen to the hymns. Or here's another thought that I've thought a lot lately. Um, the Roman Empire dominated the world. The British Empire dominated the world. They're both pretty much gone. In fact, the American empire seems to be pretty shaky, too. Church of Jesus Christ is still here. (laughs) So let's have an altar call. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that's as good good of a place as I need to stop. Hey, thank thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic back over to Chad to close us up. Is he still there? I'm still still here. Oh, I'm still here. Yeah, here I am. A hearty amen to all of that. So yeah, altar call, here we come. If We did that kind of thing, right? Here, we're not a church, but hey, thank you so much, Dave. That was both Dave's. This was a, a great conversation. I think profitable to all of us. And just, yeah, the number of comments we're getting on this, this is, this is excellent. So thank you for your time and, and blessings to your work, um, both of you. But Dave Bielan, thank you for taking the time with us today, especially. Um, I'm going thank- to, yeah, sorry. Just thank you. Wonderful. Good. Um, Hey, I am going to unpin you guys and just wrap up with a couple of announcements. Um, Laura just put the information in there about the Tuesday prayer gathering. So please join us for that too. Um, We're going to be gathering again next week, Tuesday. Um, I know our uh, timing is a little off this month, but it worked well. And next week, Tuesday, it's going to be an evening uh, Zoom meeting like this, but it's going to be really interesting. So uh, many of us have heard about the truck convoys in um, in Canada. We're not going to talk about truck convoys, but we're going to talk about Canada and, and exactly what's going on up there. And I think this is there's a, there's a related uh, sense to all of this, but we're going to have a, a, a panel and we're, we've entitled it C4 blowing up the Canadian church. So Bill C4, as you may know, was adopted and and, uh, put into uh, action just recently up in Canada. And it's a bill that that bans conversion therapy. If you don't know what that is, look it up, Um, but it goes far beyond that. And that's what the panel is going to be discussing. So we've got a a couple of CRC pastors, Matt Vanden Havel from Covenant CRC in Calgary, and also Ryan Brom from Fellowship CRC in Brighton, Ontario. They're gonna be on the panel along with a couple of experts. So we have Ian Proven from, um, Proven from uh, Regent University and then Marty Moore for the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms. So I think that's gonna be a real rich discussion. Uh, Steven Terpstra, although he is in Borkelo CRC here in Michigan, um, he's gonna be moderating the conversation and he himself is Canadian. So we figured he would fit into that mix. But next week, Tuesday, eight o'clock PM Eastern Standard Time or five o'clock Uh, Pacific Standard Time, and we will uh, be gathering in the same spot. If you have not been a part of the email list, put your email in the chat right here. We'll leave this running for a few minutes so you can get your information in there, and we'll make sure that you have the connecting information. Um, If you haven't looked through the chat much, you might want to scroll through. um, uh, Pastor Corey Naderveld in Hudsonville, Michigan, here at Hillcrest CRC, he um, posted uh, uh, an event that they're going to have with Jeff Wyma, who's going to be working through the report um, with them. So they're going to be able to live stream that and we'll be able to, um, you can join Hillcrest CRC for that as well too. Or is that going to be live stream, Corey? Maybe I should ask you because it says West Michigan folks. Want to jump in, Corey, if you're still here? I don't think he is. Anyway, we'll get you information on that. But hey, thank you all for coming. I think that's all we're gonna announce for now. Just stay tuned to the website, abideproject.org. There are new articles being added all the time and we're just you know, taking, taking a look at the human sexuality report and the implications for our denomination, for our churches, for our people, 
as we stand on the truth of Jesus Christ. And I, I love what uh, Dave said. I mean, the, the church of Christ prevails. Jesus always wins. And um, we're with Jesus. And that's what uh, makes this a, a joyful battle, even though it is a battle. So take courage, brothers and sisters, and uh, just blessings throughout this time. So with that, I'm going to close in prayer and then dismiss you all back to the work that you no doubt has been piling up while we've been in this chat. So in the Zoom, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just give you praise and thanks. I thank you for, uh, for brothers like Dave Bielan, for the difficult ministry that he has had and yet the joy that exudes from him as he sees you at work and he follows you in truth and grace and love. So, Father, we just pray your blessing upon him as he does his continued work at this stage of his life, and whether it's grandparenting or, or, or just continuing to pastor in so many different ways, we just pray your blessing upon him. So, Father, we pray for our denomination. We pray for not just an institution, but we pray for the dear brothers and sisters and the souls that you have gathered into this family. And, Lord, we pray that we would have wisdom and that we would have courage to stand upon your word so that life can be given to those who are seeking life. Those who, oh Lord, that you have called as your own, we pray that you would just renew and strengthen through the truth, through your mercy. And so Lord, we thank you for that. Oh Lord, walk with us. We pray for those who do oppose us. And Lord, even though the battle seems difficult, and even though, boy, we'd love to just rattle swords with the enemies, Lord, we just pray that you would move hearts. Lord, that you would bring a confidence in your word and in your truth and in the way you have designed your world and your creation and have designed each of us, that we would rest upon your wisdom and your goodness. So, Father, we pray that you would soften our hearts even as you thicken our skin. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all God's people said together.